All right. Well, hey, everyone. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and this is your weekly space hangout for Friday, April 18th, 2014. And we've got a very special event today, which is that we're going to try and break in the middle of the show and watch the SpaceX launch. Check this out. Hold on. Uh, Should be a T20 right now, I think. <clears throat> yeah, right over here. I got it going in the background. Boom. Um, so to all the uh, all of the uh, foreign news agencies are going to claim copyright on that clip of NASA television. I just want to say in advance, uh, to hell with you. Uh, I will fight <laughs> you to the bitter end because it's free NASA feed. Anyway, you don't so, own NASA hey, TV. NASA yeah, TV. NASA NASA TV. TV. <laughs> All right, so I want my NASA TV. <laughs> joining me this week, we got Sandy Springman at Arecibo Observatory. Hey, Sandy. Are you muted? No, I'm not. Hello. No, not. Hi. I'm actually at home today, but Arecibo Observatory is 20 minutes that way. Right. Could, could have just kept the lie going. Fine. We got Brian Coberline. Hey, Brian. Hi. How you doing? Good. Casey Dreyer from the Planetary Society. Hey, Casey. Hey, how's it going? Unlike Sandy, I am actually in Arecibo Observatory. <laughs> right. Yeah, we all are. We're all in the Arecibo <laughs> Observatory today. Dave Dickinson at the Arecibo Observatory in Tampa, Florida. Hey, actually, I'm 100 miles west of the launch, so all, oh. only with the cloud cover here, I won't see it. So. Oh, really? Would you be able to see it? I, I would. I would if the if the skies were crystal clear. Mid afternoon, usually, it's it's uh, not the case. But uh, night launches, you can see from here really well. Daytime launches sometimes. It depends on the launch angle. This one's going to the ISS, so it's going to have that headed to the northeast kind of angle. So I probably would be able to see it if it was clear. Got Jason Major. Hey, Jason. Hey there. I'm uh, I'm I'm home as well, and the RC or RC Observatory is about <laughs> 280 minutes that way. So. Uh, yeah. Well, I'm I am also at the RC Observatory. See, so, oh man, we just. Uh, we have too much fun here. All right, so this week, we're going to talk about the SpaceX launch, whether or not it was successful. We will know in real time, but we'll also see a test of the uh, of the Falcon 9R uh, with legs, and we'll show you that, which was a total success. Uh, we're going to talk about, um, of course, the discovery of a second Earth. Uh, or or was the discovery of a second Earth? Is it? Um, you got is some it? funding issues for Opportunity uh, and NASA. I wonder who's going to talk about that. Um, we've got some problems with the uh, Bicep two inflation results, uh, CERN discovery of exotic particles, um, some pictures I think of the lunar eclipse. Hopefully, uh, the upcoming Lyriad meteor shower, and uh, the Laddie impact. Farewell, Laddie. So, uh, well, let's start with the big, big, big news, and let's just keep the timing going on here in the background. Oh, right, and before we get started, you can, of course, always communicate and talk to us. The way to do that is to use the Q&A app, which you should be able to see. If you're watching this video anywhere, it says that we're interacting with the public. Click that, and you can see the Q&A app. You can ask your questions, and I will try to remember to fire these off to the... Uh, to everyone. Oh yeah, and that new moons. Uh, Elad Avron recommended that too. You worked on that, Jason, so you probably can talk intelligently about that, right? The uh, the, the new moon of Saturn. Oh yeah. All right, I can. Yeah, yeah. I can go. Over okay. That. All right. We'll just try to remember to add that. Sure. Um, okay. Cool. So let's let's just start with the big big news, which is the discovery of another Earth. So I I don't know if anybody knows this, but I hate embargoes. Absolutely hate them, and I uh, Universe Today is an embargo-free place. So I was as surprised as everybody on what the Kepler announcement was going to be. I was assuming it was going to be just like, hey, Kepler's doing great. We're able to get more data. But in fact, it was like, oh, and here we've discovered the Holy Grail. Uh, so so, so who, who worked on this one? Um, mate, mate, mate. All right, well, then why don't you give, bring us up to speed on what was discovered? Yeah, I mean, it was, uh, uh, you know, every now and then, uh, Kepler, the Kepler mission team comes out with uh, a press a press announcement, and everyone wonders, oh, what is it, what is it? The last time, it was, oh, they oh, they just doubled all of the uh, exoplanets that they confirmed. Uh, so now, you know, they're up to, you know, over uh, over 700, almost 800 of these things. Um, but yesterday's Added news... on one day. They had I, yeah, yeah, literally one day. On oh, one by day. the way, double that, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yesterday's news, 
uh, was that the Kepler mission team has confirmed the first rocky Earth-sized exoplanet in the habitable zone of its host star. And now, if now if that's not the the holy grail of what they've been looking for, other than finding it, you know, you know uh, uh, covered in alien cars and planes and and jellyfish, uh, you know, I don't know what it is. This this is this is the it, first time. What, go ahead. This is it. I mean, this is what we've the, been we've been predicting. Is, this we've been saying yes. it's just a matter of time. It's in the Kepler data. Right. Here it comes. And and you know, five years of Kepler looking at the same patch of night sky has led up to this moment where we have finally located uh, the the Earth-sized rocky world that could, not saying it does, but could very well have, you know, water on its surface if the atmospheric conditions are right, um, you know, if a lot of conditions are right, but it's in the right spot. It um, The planet uh, orbits the star. It's a red dwarf. Um, named Kepler 186. It's located a little over 490 light years from Earth. Uh, it's in the uh, uh, constellation Cygnus, uh, which is basically where Kepler looks. It always just stares at that one patch of sky. Um, and unlike our G-type star, Sun, uh, this is an M dwarf, so it's a red dwarf. It's smaller. It's cooler than our than our sun. As a result, the habitable zone is much much closer in. So uh, the planet Kepler 186f is the fifth planet discovered so far in the 186 system, and its orbit is just around where the orbit of Mercury would be in our solar system. Uh, so it's so it's pretty tight tight in there. But it's you know its habitable zone. Is because it's that close in to uh, a much cooler star. Um, we don't know the mass of this planet. We don't particularly know exactly what it's made of, but its size is just over one Earth diameter. I think it's 1.1 Earth diameters, um, and it orbits in a 130-day year. Um, I mean, that's that's kind of all we know at this moment. But it, it's it's the habitable part. That's that's really important. Liquid water, if it's there, could <laughs> exist on its surface. It could, we could have uh, uh, rain, lakes, streams, rivers filled with Kepler 186 effian fish and and whatever you know. That right. that's so this is this is the rain, important stuff. Speaking of rain, then I would like someone to rain on the parade. <laughs> um, I'm gonna who would who would like to uh, sort of take some of the excitement out of this. What? It sounded to me like, it like Brian's job. Yeah, Brian, how how <laughs> should we not get super excited about this? How, how should you not get excited about this? Okay, this is anything I say is not to belittle this discovery, which is actually a big discovery. This is a big deal. Okay, a um, couple of reasons to be cautious. One is it's orbiting a red dwarf. Red dwarfs tend to have larger solar flares. They tend to have large solar wind. That would tend to make these planets dry. So you'd have to have a strong magnetic field to resist that. Um, we know that this is an active star. We know it has star spots, for example, because in the same Kepler data we can see that. Um, the other thing is we don't. They these planets tend to be tidally locked because they're so close. This one is far enough out that it might not be tidally locked, but the close ones they tend to be tidally locked. So. If you just go by the statistics, it is more likely to be more Mars-like than Earth-like. Um, however, it is still not a gas planet. It's not a super-Earth. It is an Earth in a habitable temperature zone. So the possibility of water is there. You know, It would still have to have a strong magnetic field. We don't know anything about it. We don't know what its mass is. But we know it probably doesn't have a thick hydrogen atmosphere, given where it is, too. So... so you know, it's the right size, it's the right distance, wrong star, not Earth-like in that sense. Now, Sandy, uh, I know that, I mean, this the discovery of a, I guess, Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone, it's not surprising that it was found on, around one of these M-class stars, right? Because they're the ones that, I guess, you know, it's going to go around more rapidly, and so it's going to be seen more often. Is that right? You're muted. Oh, good. It's it's been a, a long time since I've I've been in the exoplanet business, so I can't give you a, a really good answer for that. But I can tell you though that um, some people are saying, "Oh, this is Earth 2.0. It's in a habitable zone." But 
like Brian was saying earlier, Mars is technically in our habitable zone around the sun. Venus is technically in the habitable zone. And as far as we know, there's not a lot of life on either of those ones. So habitable in this case means it could support life as we know it, but it's we have no idea if it actually supports life or not. So, and a good question here from Rich Hayward, I think this is great. So, I mean, it's far away, it's close to 500 light years away. Mm -hmm. Do we have any kind of technology, any kind of technique that would allow us to do any kind of follow-up observations to try and get a sense of its atmosphere, whether it really is a blasted hellscape or... That's yeah, going can... to that's going to come. Um, Unfortunately, Kepler can only look at these planets. They can only detect these planets. Right. Uh, the ability to to look into their atmospheres, that's going to be further missions. Um, you know, like like the James Webb Space Telescope. Obviously, 186F is going to be uh, right at the top of the list of exoplanets to take a look at and figure out w what's going on in its atmosphere. There is a technique to do it. If you have a transiting planet, what you can do is you can look at the spectrum as the star, as the planet passes in front of the star, when it does, the atmosphere hits first and then the planet. And then when it leaves, the planet leaves first and then the atmosphere. So you can look at the fringes of this dip. If you have a high enough resolution image, you can look at the fringes of this dip at different wavelengths and you can get an idea of the spectrum that way. But do we have an instrument use, that's capable of, of that use resolution? You can Spitzer for that and you can use Hubble for that, but it's harder to yeah. get time on Hubble than it is on Spitzer. And yeah. even though the Spitzer Space they, Telescope they, they, Go ahead. Oh, I was, I was just going to say they have done this with some planets, but not they're, they're the gassy planets. But those are typically the gas giants, so that right. have a lot, a lot of atmosphere going on. I mean, even if this, right. even if Kepler 186f had an atmosphere that was, you know, a, a few times what Earth has, would it be, would it be enough to detect uh, using that method? You, you bring up a good point, Sandy, because at a distance, I've said that before, is that Venus would look Earth-like if you were looking at it as an exoplanet from a distance, but I wouldn't build an interstellar arc and head there just yet. <laughs> um, I think what, you know, we really need one of those star shade ideas, right? One of these coronagraphs that we can the, have. The big sunflower? Yeah, the big yeah, sunflower yeah. that's blocking the light. The terrestrial really planet good. finder. Yes, the terrestrial planet finder. Boy, wouldn't it be great if we had the terrestrial planet finder right now? I wish we hadn't canceled that. Well, one of the one of the uh, other important aspects of this particular discovery is is finding that there are obviously now we know Earth-sized exoplanets around these M M dwarf stars um, because they're the most common stars in the galaxy. Seventy percent of the stars in the Milky Way uh, uh, classify as these these red dwarfs. So having an Earth-sized world around one of them just, you know, boosts the odds that that there's a lot of these out there. But isn't the thinking that these M these M dwarfs are, as you said, higher solar flares potentially, and the planets have to orbit very closely? That they're going to blast the the atmosphere away. They're going to scorch the landscape. Pretty much they are, anything. They, they are stable for a long period of time. That's one. If you get past that initial phase, yeah. then you've right. got a trillion yeah. years of nice. Yeah. So life could evolve. You know, it has a long time to evolve. That's one check they have in their in their favor. And one of the particular things about uh, Kepler 186 is it happens to be a hot M dwarf. So it's 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 brighter, it's hotter than than maybe some of its other cousin uh, stars of the same variety. So uh, 186F can be a little further out. <laughs> yeah. So, but I think this is going to be the first one. There's going to be a bunch more in that data. We're going to get a bunch more of these announcements. They're coming. They're going to come fast and furious. I, I what, predict. One of the things that's really interesting. Is Go ahead, Brian. Really? One of the things that's really interesting is the Kepler data taking is done. We, this period of, of Kepler's data is done. So this is all data mining now. We're actually going back through the data to find these discoveries, which is, I think, important to keep in mind, is that once the mission is over, it's still not over. But there's the potential of getting more data out of Kepler. What about using, Absolutely. say, the James Webb uh, for doing some of these follow-up observations? Is it going to have the capabilities we need? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Better than Spitzer. It's the next. Yes. There's, there's a lot of, of observatories that are coming out in which we're going to be able to get planetary data. I mean, Gaia, for example, is not specifically looking for planets, but because it looks at spectra in high resolution, we can use that Doppler 
variation to find planets. So here's what's weird for me, is I don't feel as excited about this as I would think that I should be. Shame on you, Fraser. I know, I know. I, mean, like, so have I, I was, be, have I was I become... told about this in 2008, 2007, when I started taking classes on exoplanets, that, yeah, this is going to happen. It'll happen in five, ten years. We're going to find an Earth-like planet in a habitable zone. Mm -hmm. And it, we found it! Science! Yeah. Prediction! Yeah, but it's not quite... I'm there. Were you expecting little green I, men, I, Fraser? Oh, like, oh, yes, what do you course. want? No, no, I want, I want it around <laughs> a similar mass star as the sun. I guess. I'm, yeah. I'm, they, I'm they, worried. These that red dwarfs, gonna... they freak me out. They, they, <laughs> they just, do you watch just too the, much British sci-fi? With sci -fi. the flares and the, you know, and the yeah, yeah, and the holograms I, and the cats. I'm, I'm worried. Falling. I'm worried it's going to be the next water on Mars, Voyager leaving the solar system kind of story because it seems like. Yeah. A lot of these exoplanet stories are kind of devolving into the Tatooine type exoplanet, the Earth like exoplanet. You know, it's, I think the public. You know, well, yeah. Yeah. you know, it's, <laughs> it's funny. It's like it's, it's, how it's, being, it's how it's being picked up and, and spun not only by the uh, uh, people who are writing the, the science press releases, but also, you know, what the media wants to do. In fact, during yesterday's um, teleconference, the first. The first questions that were coming in from um, from reporters from you know from various uh, uh, places ar around the world literally was, is there life? I mean that's that's what they want. They want to they want to hear that. They want to run the headline with that. They want the lead to be you know we find we find well, life. And if they're not getting that, they want to then they want to push it that direction. J and Jason, and, did you did you see the bit where somebody was claiming the artist's conception was photoshopped? <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> I kid you not. <laughs> uh, fake. Um, no, but seriously, I mean that they, you know, and I think that it's great that that people are excited about that and they want to think that way. But the problem is, is that it ends up lessening the actual impact of of the discovery that that has happened. This is huge. The, we this is the first, you know, the, our first exoplanet was discovered in 1994. Uh, Kepler launched in 2009, so it was just literally just a month over uh, five years ago. And here it is. I mean, there are hundreds and hundreds of confirmed exoplanets, thousands on the list waiting to be confirmed, and we now have our our uh, 21st, literally the 21st habitable world that's been identified. I mean, that's a lot happening in a short period of time. Literally, these things are falling out of the falling out of the space closet. To give you an example, the original cosmos... Two, two minute warning, guys. I'm going to go to the SpaceX launch in one minute. So. Okay. Got it. Go, in the original cosmos, when that aired, there were no known exoplanets. And now with the new one airing, we have over 1400 confirmed exoplanets, including an Earth-sized one in a habitable zone. That's how far we're going I'm just, I'm just not feeling it. I don't know. I don't know what it is. I'm just, you know, maybe you I've been in living future. in the future for so long that, uh, yeah, maybe I just my heart's been broken so many times. No, this is good. I'll, I'll, I'll be all right. <laughs> um, okay, so why don't we set this up then, David? So, so what is the SpaceX launch that we're about to this, enjoy? This is CRS-3 going to the ISS. It's launching 26 minutes behind the International Space Station. Interestingly, and there's a lot of interest on this on Twitter right now, UK may see this uh, Dragon and SpaceX launch come over hidden about 20 minutes afterwards if it goes off, because it's just after sunset there right now. So I was talking to some people over there about seeing it. It's going to dock with the International Space Station on Sunday, April 20th at 11.14 Universal Time, 7.14 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. And I was over there for the second launch. They're kind of cool to see. They're, they're uh, small, fast movers compared to the shuttle, but still kind of interesting to see. Yeah, it's uh, weather. I think they said they were about 40% chance for go, and they're under the solar proton flux level, which there was some concern because there was an M-class flare earlier today, and I was like, hmm, I wonder if this is going to scrub this launch. And interestingly, the Russians have a ship out currently watching this launch, too, out in the ocean. So they're, they're kind of very Cold War type stuff going on. But there is, there's is there been a news article uh, this morning that came up that says every time SpaceX tries to do this launch, this ship comes up. And it's so they're definitely monitoring it for some reason. Looks pretty cloudy over there. 
It is, yeah. It's and it's going to get worse too. So if they don't get off today, I uh, I got a feeling uh, they're not going to get off. Ooh, looks like they're here. We go. Okay. Oh, there. oh, oh, I see smoke. Oh, they're moving. Very cool. <laughs> looks like they're shooting from across Banana Creek too, across the causeway. That's about where I was for the S two. Cool. I think it's the first time we got a live launch feed into the space hangout. Yeah, I yeah, know. This any, is the first. And if anybody, anyone wants if you, to hate, it says NASA up in the upper right corner. Yep. Yeah. It, doesn't, it doesn't matter. If, I will get the if, takedown request. If, if you live anywhere between 40 degrees latitude north and south and you have an ISS pass, you may be able to see the dragon. I've seen dragon following the ISS. Right now, the, the passes favor 40 degrees north to 60 degrees north. That's why UK is interested to see this pass. But you, the northern U.S. will have passes tonight, too, and they don't dock for another two days. So you may see the uh, Dragon capsule chasing the ISS here over the next few evenings. This, this payload usually generates six objects, too. The uh, Dragon S2, the S1, they're going to try to fly back today and land in the water. That ought to be interesting, and that's probably yeah. coming up here in an hour or so. Uh, the S2, the Dragon capsule, uh, the two clamshell fairings, and the two solar panels. So uh, there's a friend of mine on one of the launches. He saw all six objects after the first orbit come over, so they are visible. All right, I think we're done. And, and, and Jason, I think, clouds, I, think, I think you wrote some about the payload. I know they're sending up some kind of the, uh, salad bar to the ISS or something. Yeah, the, uh, the, veggie, um, the Veg 01 veggie experiment, yeah. Uh, yeah. Which, which has been in the works for a while. And uh, it's kind of cool. It uses this expandable Teflon bellows to serve as basically like a greenhouse for a, a, a setup of um, little, you know, uh, plant packets where they can basically have like a miniature garden up on the space station and they can grow uh, all sorts of produce, you know, uh, uh, sa you know salad, um, lettuce. I think they're going to start off with romaine lettuce, um, you know, various things that you would, that are edibles and uh, they can have fresh, uh, fresh produce up there eventually if this, if this works out. Robonaut 2 is getting his legs too and that's another notable yeah. thing that's on, the, on board this one. So. so does anybody question Elon Musk anymore? <laughs> I sure don't hear that anymore. You know, For it's interesting. commercial crew, they do. It's it's interesting to think the whole scenario going on with uh, Russia, Crimea, Ukraine, and the ISS, and what's going on there with co with collaboration. It's an interesting what if if SpaceX had the money thrown at it, how quickly could they get commercial crew up right now? If we had to say, hey, we need to get our own access back to the International Space Station. It's but just, isn't the Dragon human rated anyway? I mean, they're ready to. They're. Yeah. They, I, I think they could do it within six months to a year if they really had to, uh, you know, if they had if, if, if they stepped it up. So it was, it was kind of built with human rating in mind, but it's yeah. there's a lot of steps they have to go through. They, they'd they still have to rate. certify it. They still yeah. have to fly it and uh, and certify everything before they could Ooh, do it. Like separation. People in it. Look at that separation. I love the cool. the live view from the spacecraft perspective. This is pretty great. Yeah, talking oh, about the future, Fraser. Here's your private cargo company launching to a football uh, field-sized space station in orbit and with live HD video the whole way. Not yeah. Bad. Well, we're commenting on an information network. <laughs> and we're, and we're yeah. commenting, yeah, exactly. And here oh, we are all in, around the world in this, this having sets a live up, conversation about it. This yep. sets up, they have to do a contingency spacewalk to uh, Elizabeth Howell's been covering this more than I have, but I believe they're going to do it on the 22nd. I'm doing that without looking at yeah. any information, but I'm pretty certain that it's uh, they're they're having some kind of I think it's it's a uh, some kind it's of backup external. computer. It's a backup yeah. computer that needs to be to fixed. It's three bolts apparently. It'll be an easy spacewalk, but it's an emergency spacewalk. Yeah. yeah. So you kind of want to get this done sooner rather than later. I think if it had launched earlier this week, they would have done the repair on Sunday. But I think the spacewalk yeah, is now on Wednesday. They, they kind of had to shoehorn the space repair between the Dragon launch and the next Progress launch, I believe. So it's a uh, yeah. So, so now that's all going to that's all going to happen. Now. The interesting thing here too is that after the separation, we know that right around now or in the next ten minutes, the uh, first stage is going to try to fire its rocket again and and deploy its little landing legs to to test the whole reusability concept of the first stage of the Falcon. Uh, then and I know that SpaceX has said that they have about a 
they think a 30% chance of this working, but they're, they're trying to develop this whole reusability factor of their rockets. So this is all happening right now. I very much doubt we'll see a live feed of that. But that's something to pay attention to. Yeah, and if anybody's in UK right now, it's on its way. So in about 15 minutes, if your skies are clear, you may see this come up overhead. So it's, they, they used to see the, the shuttle and the external tank after separation like come overhead as a pair uh, right over the UK. And it's on that same orbital track right now after the ISS, so it is going to come right up over UK at sunset right now. This just feels like we're CNN, doesn't it? Or, like, better. <laughs> like we are, like, live coverage... See, with, CNN uh, will barely give this a sound bite, though. So yeah, no, I know, I know. So yeah, no, obviously they won't. If we're CNN, we'd have to go to the plane now. But, but we are, you know, we are providing <laughs> live, intelligent commentary on a space launch. With yeah. I cats. love how that how that engine shroud heats up like that. Yeah, yeah. That's I wonder if that was on purpose just to make it look cool. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's, just, yeah. it's really it's LEDs. Yeah, yeah, let's let's make it glow of, orange. That's the kind of stuff they can do. Uh, one thing I did want to say That's is that I think this is actually a very, very important launch for SpaceX because, you know, they have this whole, you know, this whole commercial crew thing has been coming up again with this tensions with Russia, and Congress has generally been quite uh, hesitant about commercial crew because it kind of undercuts a lot of the institutionalized situ uh, jobs and funding and all the other stuff that goes into classic NASA rocket well, can you Can you talk about that, Casey? Because we've, you know, while we're enjoying this launch, do you want to talk a bit about what's going on with the uh, NASA funding? Sure. Yeah, and I, yeah, so let me, the, so the, the commercial crew stuff, again, this is really interesting because, you know, every year for the last four years, the Obama administration has requested a lot more money than Congress has given to commercial crew. Originally, they wanted to have four competitors. They're down to like two and a half right now, and then they might need to down select to one they really want to keep two for competition. The two major players, of course, are SpaceX and then Boeing with their kind of low-cost commercial, uh, commercial crew vehicle. So we have this whole context now of mixed in with this Russian uh, tensions in Crimea and saying, you know, right now, obviously, we're just launching off of the Soyuz rocket. And if the Obama, Obama administration, NASA administrator, claims that if they'd gotten full funding since the beginning, we'd be launching commercial crew next year, and this wouldn't really be an issue. Instead, we're looking at the earliest, maybe 2017. And so the big problem is then, so Congress is saying, all right, maybe we really do need to fund commercial crew to get uh, U.S. astronauts, you know, kind of independently having access to space. And my feeling was that this launch that we've seen today has been delayed multiple times. Um, there were leaks in the SpaceX first stage. There was also kind of a contamination issue with one of the other shrouds in the, in the rocket. And if this hadn't gone well, this would have very much gone into the politics of saying that commercial cr crew is not going to be a safe option, SpaceX can't be really dependent, and so forth and so on. And so the fact that we're seeing at least a successful launch to this point really helps bolster the argument for commercial crew as a viable and safe way to launch astronauts. And I think this Elon Musk is going to be breathing a lot easier today. <laughs> That's my take on this. And then I can talk about larger NASA budget issues here as we're watching. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was figuring. Yeah, go ahead and um, sort of so continue on that conversation. This, uh, so again, so this is all in the context of NASA's been proposed to be cut again this year by about $200 million. Uh, we had a senator from who's kind of the, the most powerful senator on the U.S. Appropriations Committee saying NASA will get at least what it got last year. So we, we feel pretty good that NASA will at least maintain what it had last year, which isn't great number, but it's not a catastrophic number either. And the big question, again, is going to be how much is commercial crew going to get this year in the context of the Russian situation? So that's going to be a big player. Um, they had a lot of questions from Congress has been meeting the last few weeks about SLS funding and Orion funding. Um, you've had questions from Congress about planetary science funding, which is seeing a cut again. And, you know, it's one of those things where the Senate will be meeting next week, and that'll kind of be their little view into, you know, what the Senate sees as the major problems with the president's proposal. Already you've seen, again, the, the lead person on the Senate, Barbara Mikulski, say, we really consider the president's budget as advisory, which means, eh, you know, we'll, <laughs> we'll take here and there, and then we'll kind of do our own thing with it. So it'll be, we'll kind of read the tea leaves next uh, two weeks after, I think May 2nd is when they meet. And so it's this process is continuing. The House has met. Senate will meet next uh, month, and then they'll kind of each have their own versions of what they'd like to spend on NASA over the summer. Uh, they'll take a big break during the summer and campaign, since it's election season here in the House and Senate. And then we'll have some kind of, uh, 
ideally some kind of budget agreed upon before October 1st. No one really knows if they're going to be able to pull that off, but they're actually trying relatively hard to do it, mainly, I think, to show voters that, hey, look, Congress can work. <laughs> so we'll see how that goes. Uh, within the larger context, then, uh, something that I've been talking about a lot at the Planetary Society, and something that's actually been getting a decent amount of press in the LA Times, New York Times, NPR, is... You know, if you if you take NASA's budget, you know, seventeen and a half billion or so, and you break it down into all the little, ooh, there's a, a the Falcon the Dragon separation there yeah. happening right now. I don't know if everyone can see that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, beautiful. So cool. Man, they've had good coverage. You know, in the past they've dropped out their satellite uh, data relay coverage a variety of times. I think this has been smooth almost the entire time. There were some there's cubes. There's a couple of glitches that I saw. Yeah. Yeah. There's What's a that? I think a project called Kicksat that's Sat. getting that's right. je uh, jettisoned off. And are those some of the additional satellites there, just in the yes. bottom there? No, I think those are I think those are just uh, like fragments or ice or something like that. But there there are some CubeSat payloads on this. We're living in the future. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> the. Uh, so let me just jump back to Opportunity while we have this nice background to look at. Um, so Opportunity, of course, has been on Mars for 10 years now. Then he also has a, have, we have a satellite around the moon called the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Both of those missions, kind of surprisingly and kind of tucked out of the way here, were zeroed out in next year's NASA budget. So basically implying, you know, if Congress doesn't do anything, we switch off Opportunity around September 30th, and we crash Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter into the moon maybe a month or two before. And that's kind of caused quite a bit of um, people being upset because, you know, these are functioning missions. We've spent a lot of money to get these to where they are. They're still doing great science. Why are we turning these off? And I published this article on the Planetary Society. I believe, Fraser, you'll link to this uh, throughout the video. But the big problem is that, you know, we're actually suffering from a burden of success at NASA. Last decade, NASA launched about a dozen spacecraft. Kepler was one of those for plan in their planetary missions. And it costs money to, to, to run these missions, anywhere from a few million dollars for Messenger to $60 million for Cassini around Saturn. And if you add all of these up, it actually represents about a quarter to a fifth of NASA's entire budget for its planetary exploration program. So as the budget for planetary has been cut, you've kind of run up against this minimum level just to keep your existing missions functioning, and you start running out of room. Where are you going to cut? And so the administration is saying, yeah, let's get rid of these older missions so we can start pursuing new missions. And that's an argument we made for that, but then there's also the argument we made for when are we going to have a rover on Mars again looking at these clay deposits around Endeavour Crater? Probably never within our lifetimes. And so we're trying really hard to make sure that those basically saying, Let's take the third option, which is just give more money to planetary exploration, and you don't have to make this issue. So that's one of the major things going on right now within NASA, which is, and you're having the same problem in astrophysics where they canceled the SOFIA um, observatory uh, just as it kind of hit its stride. Uh, they still don't even have enough money to operate all the missions from Hubble to Spitzer to Kepler to anything. Uh, so they're going to have to make some hard choices there too, or as we generally advocate, just give them a little more money and let these things keep running. Casey, that was a great article too, by the way. I just I read that uh, a couple days ago. Um, Thanks. That was really, really informative. Uh, on, and I like the, the idea of that strange uh, punishment for success, you know, that, that happens. Um, you know, these, these missions have been more than successful and are in extended missions now, and, and upon extended missions, and then, and then they're going to be shut off, which, is, which makes absolutely no sense at all from a scientific perspective um, because, you know, they, they are gathering data like, uh, like we've never had before. Right, yeah, they're going on 10 uh, years. Yeah, um, 10 years. We've got a bunch of stories to get through, and... Uh, you know, as always, I've offered KC Canada. We'd be glad to take over operation of your missions. Anything you want to drop, we'll pick them up. Just let us know. <laughs> I'll pass um, that along. So, uh, Sandy, I'm going to uh, set up your SpaceX uh, landing video. So maybe you can talk over this one here in a second. I mean, so we, we've 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 talked a lot about SpaceX today. So let's just continue with the launch theme. So this is a Falcon 9 test launch that went up to 250 meters which is about 820 feet for those of us who don't use the metric system. So to give you a sense of scale, that's not quite as high as the Arecibo dish is wide. 
and you can actually see a bunch of cows chilling off in the lower <laughs> left of the video. They're about so this to is, freak I guess, out. <laughs> so this is Texas, I think this is happening. And so this footage is absolutely amazing. This comes from what Jeff Faust on Twitter told me is a hexacopter. So I'm not sure. I'm pretty sure this is some sort of uncrewed vehicle that someone is remotely controlling, yeah. watching this thing go up with its legs own. extended. And then it goes up, it goes up, it goes up. Somewhere in this cow field in Texas, the space age is here, and it's been certified by a bunch of bovines. They actually test these out just outside of Waco, which is uh, just a couple miles, a couple hours uh, uh, south of Dallas. Yeah. If the, uh, Tesla also tests their batteries out there, so that if they blow up, you only have to flip burgers. <laughs> Sorry. So then this thing lands. It's amazing. Cows My space now, now I, you know, we've shown this off before, right? This is very similar to the grasshopper launch. but Right, but, but this has happened a lot more quickly, and it lands on its legs, and it goes up to 250 meters. And so, meters? That's a, and so that's a bit of a sneak preview of, of what this, I guess, of what this launch is going to be, um, or the landing, theoretically, that the uh, the Falcon... Nine is going to attempt to, you know, land or hover above the water at the end of its that first stage, and then it's going to drop into the ocean. So, this is to show right, you, this is serious. it will be reusable. This is uh, stepping stones to Mars, folks. It's you got to make sure that your rockets can be used again and again and again. Dave Dickinson, take the wind out of our sails. Take the wind out as of my far as, Oh, as far as far as the, the SpaceX launches, well, the and the the reusability landing. Oh, the reusability. Yeah, it's uh, I, I certainly hope they they uh, they pioneer that and they actually make that work. I don't know how financially sound that's going to be. I mean, they tried to do it with the shuttle, and it took like an army of engineers to rework and refurbish that. And I know the shuttle had kind of its own. Uh, special problems of its own with the SRVs and things like that, but I, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of a wait and see as far as, as uh, the total reusability of the system that will be cost effective as versus just throwing things away. So you, you're concerned that uh, that even if they are able to make these first stages, you know, take off and land again, and even maybe the second stages, uh, that at the end of the day, all of the refurbishment that's going to have to go in to get them flight ready again, they might as well just throw them in the garbage and build new ones. We'll, we'll see. We'll see. Like I said, I hope it, I hope it does work, but I'm kind of a wait and see with the, with that whole program. Get with the program, David. This is the future. <laughs> all right. I hope it works. It, yeah. Yeah, because that would that would change everything. So that would be great. Um, all right, Brian. Uh, so Brian, we talked about the inflation results the in the bicep two experiment and how that was evidence of inflation in the uh, cause of microwave background radiation. Everybody cheered, Nobel prizes all around. But wait, there's a problem. Maybe there may be a problem. Um, this is a new paper out that was uh, looking at other possible sources for this polarization. Basically, if you remember, the, the evidence for inflation comes from polarization of the cosmic microwave background light, specifically what's known as B-mode polarization. So you're getting microwave radiation and it's polarized. And the pattern of that tells you about inflation. So this new paper looked at something that are called radio loops. And basically, you've got these large magnetic fields, galactic sized magnetic fields, and, and we've known about these for a long time, there's nothing new about this. And when you have a magnetic field, when you have charges moving in a magnetic field, what happens is they tend to spiral along the magnetic field line because of the way the magnetic force works on charges. So if you have plasma within an area that there's a magnetic field, the charges, the, the ions, will spiral along the magnetic field and they will produce what's called synchrotron radiation. So they will create these radio waves as they're spiraling along this. This new one looks at, there's also the fact that there's dust in these areas. And the dust, when it can get a charge on it, can spiral and create microwaves, not just radio waves. And so what happens is, if there's dust there and it's creating this microwave radiation, it can look like B-mode radiation. So it can look it can look like this inflationary signal. So how far it, away would this dust be from Earth then? This would be in our galaxy. So right. this is these are from radio loops within our galaxy. So so the question is, 
the term they use is foreground versus source. So, so the idea of the foreground, because the, the cosmic microwave background has to come through everything. So it gets distorted as it goes through all the stuff to get to us. And, and that's part of the reason why B-mode is so hard, is that there's two ways to do it. One is you can get it from gravitational lensing, from the, co the original cosmic microwave background can be gravitationally lensed, and that can give you B-mode. And then it can be due to inflation, and that can be B-mode. And now it can be from dust within these radio loops that are creating m microwave radiation. They're actually emitting that. And that can look like B-mode radiation. So the question is, in the original MICEP2 paper, they didn't, they have, you, you have to eliminate kind of all the uh, foreground sources. You have to eliminate all the sources. And they eliminated a whole bunch of sources. They didn't take into account the radio loops. And, and so that's what this new paper takes. Is there takes a way them. that they could do that now? I mean, can they go back and take they a look? They can go it? back and they can look at this and see if there's still a difference. So it doesn't necessarily kill the BICEP2 results, but it shows a, a critical re weakness, which is BICEP2 looked at one wavelength. So they look at one specific wavelength range within the cosmic microwave background. And they're looking at one specific area where there are radio loops. And so it is, at this point, hard to see if there is truly an inflationary signal or if this is due to these radio loops. And, and we don't know at this point. They're, they're pointing out that this, this could be a problem, this is an issue. Now it's back in BICEP 2's core. Right. Is there is there some sort of a, is there some sort of a way that t that they can use like a, a cosmic adaptive optics type type way to to cancel that out and, and and really see what's what's going on from from these you know from these uh, really really distant sources? Well, this is this is actually what makes it really difficult because what you have to do is you have to identify all of the foreground sources. So it's kind of like looking at an image through distorted glass. And, and if you map the shape of the glass, you can then understand how that distortion occurs, and you can get an original image. But you have to take everything into account, and this is where it's difficult, because you, if you miss something, then what you think is real is actually a foreground effect or something. So nobody was thinking that, that these radio loops would create microwaves of an area that would look like B-mode radiation. I mean, they're typically, they're called radio loops because most of the signal that comes out of them really are radio waves. And so this new paper is looking at it that, no, the dust, you know, charged dust can have um, this radiation signature that looks like polarized B-mode radiation. How, how plausible does that feel to you? I, I, think, I think the big thing to keep in mind, BICEP2 is kind of a tentative result. It's, it's only a small area, it's one wavelength, and it's always been a tentative result. It has the advantage of being the first result, but we really need the larger data. The Planck data is going to be the big one. I mean, the Planck data is all sky, it's multi-wavelength. It's taking more time to do, but that's where it's going to be conclusive. That's where we're going to know whether this is or not. So, you know, Planck, BICEP2 has to go back and take this now into account and say, okay, is there still a difference? There may be. But right now we don't know. Well, one thing we know for sure <clears throat> is that there was a lunar eclipse this week. Uh, and Dave Dickinson, you were all over that, uh, warning us of the terrible <laughs> fate that would befall humanity. Yeah, the, you know, it's the funny. Blood the blood moons, the four no. blood moons. <laughs> yeah, but there's three uh, more, so the world... There's three more. So when do I get my apocalypse, and, uh, <laughs> and how was the lunar eclipse for you? No, that's... That's actually a, a, a pretty smart ploy from the people that are trying to sell the, the Blood Moon DVDs at 1995 because they've got all of this year and next year to, to high moon going on. So it's pretty Can smart I buy a Blood Moon apart. DVD? <laughs> I, think, I think it's John Hagee or it's somebody that's promoting the whole uh, gloom and doom on these on the Lunar Tetrad. But, but yes, there was a lunar eclipse, total lunar eclipse, first of 2014, first eclipse of any kind for this year. Uh, Tuesday morning, it was me and uh, Astro Katie and Scientific Scott, Scott Lewis. We were broadcasting it for Space Fans News. Uh, you were you were there for a little bit, Fraser, right? I jumped in for a second, and then I hopped on an airplane, yeah. Yeah, you were at the airport, yeah. But uh, I was amazed, again, at how many people. This is kind of like the Mars Curiosity landing. I was amazed how many people were up at 2 or 3 in the morning to cover this, because at first I thought, Tuesday morning, it's a work day, it's a school day, there's not going to be many people. But it's I was really impressed, and it was one of the brighter eclipses 
that I had seen for a while. Uh, probably not the brightest eclipse, but this one was was uh, it was red. The moon turned red. There was a nice. I've got one of my photo uh, montages that I put together real quick. It was the first thing I did after I got done filming the eclipse. Took about an hour nap. Did a radio interview with a local radio station and then turned around and wrote the article for Universe Today. I'm still seeing awesome photos coming in now. Yeah. Uh, right now, there's a lot of people are doing some pretty awesome uh, montages. And, yeah, some and great time lapses. Video. So, there's, yeah, yeah, you're going to be... Yeah, I saw a time lapse there. video, too, that came out. That was pretty amazing that somebody did that. This yeah. is one of the longest ones we've got until 2018. And there's another one in October 8th. The circumstances for the East Coast aren't quite as good. We nearly got clouded out here. I thought we were going to. A lot of the U.S. East Coast got clouded out, yes. Uh, just north of us, I think the dividing line, uh, Richard Hay up in Jacksonville, Florida, got a view of it. I think the dividing line was just north of him, and then everybody east of the Mississippi uh, totally missed out on this one. But there's another one coming October 8th, and then there's another one next year in April, and another one in October. So there's there's more chances. North America gets all four of these eclipses, too. So yep. I mean, This was my best view before it started raining. Oh, I had a great view. As, as, as I said, I, I was on an airplane, just a quick airplane from Vancouver to Victoria, and then it was totally clouded over. And as I drove north along Vancouver Island, I guess around 2 in the morning or so, things got clear, and it was boom, just, just nearing the end of the uh, sort of eclipse part and moving into the red zone. Yeah, the, and it, this, was, it was just, it was, I mean, Mars was right beside it, and yeah, Spike was yeah. right there, it was fantastic. Yeah, I got a lot of questions about, what are those two stars next to it? Yep, there was Spica, and there was Mars, and there was 76 Virginis was very close to it, too, because a lot of the photos I got, I thought it was Spica, and then I took a closer look, I was like, no, that's too close, and there was, there was, uh, 76 Virginis was actually occulted by the eclipsed moon from Hawaii, and I don't know if anybody caught it, I kind of sent a query out to see if anybody actually uh, caught the occultation, but that would have been kind of neat to see, too. So, yeah, these are always kind of cool events. And so what's, what, pe what should people be looking uh, in the sky next? There's a Lyrid Meteors coming up next Tuesday, and it's probably worth starting to watch this weekend. The bad news is that Eclipsed Moon now is going toward last quarter, so it's going to be in the morning sky as well, so that will probably wash out some of them. But the, the April Lyrids are usually worth watching for. The, the zenithal hourly rate, the, the maximum ideal rate for these are about 20 per hour. So that, that usually piques my interest. So probably Monday, Tuesday, any clear morning I get this coming week, I'll be out watching for them. If you know where the star Vega is, the radiant is very, very close to Vega, and it's going to be high in the sky right around 4 o'clock. If you're like 30, 40 degrees north latitude, it's going to be high in the sky about 4 a.m. or so. It's going to be the best time to watch for these. And the shower has put out some outbursts, too. There have been, over the decades, once in a while we've got an outburst that's topped 100 per hour for the shower, so it's always worth kind of watching for it. Uh, Simon M. just posted into the chat that he saw the dragon in the U.K., <laughs> oh, very cool! I have to. Yeah. I'm pro my my Twitter stream is probably erupting with photos. I'm just not looking at it right now. <laughs> yeah, all of ours are. Yeah, I'll see it once I I get out of here and turn on probably. David, That's is that cool. Tuesday morning or Tuesday Tuesday night? Tuesday morning, April twenty second is the peak. Yes, and, and you know, looking at various sources, it, it's actually going to peak over twenty second and twenty third because I look at the American Meteor uh, Society, I look at the Royal Astronomical Society calendar, and I look at Guy Outwell's Almanac. All three of them have periods, uh, peaks for the shower spanning about 24 hours. So that tells me that, that, that nobody really knows that this shower needs to be better studied. It, you see a, a wide disparity as far as when the actual peak is going to arrive versus what all these different almanacs and calendars are saying for predictions. So it's over a 24-hour span. Um, so one other thing that just happened just before we went live with this uh, episode of the Weekly Space Hangout was the Laddie mission crashed into the moon. And uh, Casey, I think you were covering this as well? Yeah, I covered this a little bit. Did uh, you win the pool? <laughs> no, it actually crashed a few days earlier than even NASA science team was thinking. They had, in their press conference a few weeks ago, they were predicting April 21st. And lo and behold, this morning, uh, three days early, it uh ended up smashing into the backside of the moon. The, uh, w so what, what happened was, this has actually is a nice kind of segue from the eclipse, because, so Laddie, of course, was the small mission to look at the lunar dust environment. You know, I know, s stay in your seats for this one, but it's, it's, it's an important kind of scientific questions about the lunar dust environment, how it threatens landers and astronauts. And it also had this really cool laser communications device 
that you could actually beam basically like a fiber optic cable connecting the moon to the Earth, of course, without the cable. Huge data rates uh, as a kind of a test concept for future missions in space, so that's very cool. Um, but Laddie was always supposed to be a very short mission, about three months. It did so well, they had so much extra fuel, they extended it a whole extra month, which was up until around now. And because of that, they had never designed it to survive a lunar eclipse. Uh, so what happens with the lunar eclipse, of course, you're in your shadow, the temperature drops significantly since they're not in the sun anymore. And they were worried that their propulsive, their propulsion systems would actually freeze and they wouldn't be able to uh, control their orbit anymore. And so what they actually did last week before the eclipse was to give one last final thruster firing to put it into the laddie death spiral, where it would slowly eventually impact on the far side of the moon in order to kind of preserve any historic Apollo landing sites. And to, but they didn't want to depend on propulsion working after the eclipse. But it survived the eclipse. They didn't need to do anything more. And, and Laddie, because of all of the little you know, bumps and, and collections of more mass and less mass on the surface of the moon, pulled it down a little faster than expected. So it was a planned deorbit of the mission, mainly to protect these historic sites on the close side of the moon. Laddie reached all of its science goals and did extra science, and uh, we wish it well. It's done. Casey, were Thanks, they taking any data during the eclipse? Do you know? Uh, I was don't Laddie know. Actually... I assume they were. Um, that would make sense. I think they took data all yeah. the way up until the end. They actually, it's kind of interesting. The only way they know it, it crashed, and this was their plan from the beginning, was just to, you know, of course they track it. It goes behind the moon. They can't track it anymore, and then they look for when it would pass out from behind the moon. And then, of course, when it didn't, then they know, well, it's done. <laughs> and so then what they yes. do is that they take the, the last trajectory data that they had from it, and they actually put it through some NASA supercomputer, and it takes about 12 hours. They can actually crunch out as much, you know, they have these very detailed gravity maps of the moon now, thanks to GRAIL mission last year. And they can actually pinpoint pretty much within a few meters where they think it crashed on the backside of the moon based on the last known trajectory information. And within the next few weeks, NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, the one, by the way, that's zeroed out next year, next year's budget, uh, will try to eye its camera to where Laddie crashed and to see if they can see a small crater on the back side of the moon. That's great. Um, okay, well, why don't we wrap this up? So we'll give people a chance to uh, shamelessly self-promote themselves and the things they're working on. So, Sandy, um, where can we find out more? The birds are chirping. Sorry, it's in the Good back. Friday here, and everyone's driving their loud cars around, and the loudest car just left. Um, I'm at Sondi on Twitter, and I wrote something for Universe, or sorry, for the Planetary Society blog a couple weeks ago about how repairs to Arecibo Observatory have completed, and we're now back in business. So follow me on Twitter for coconuts, cats, and klystrons and other radar adventures. Awesome, Brian Coberline. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Brian Coverline, and you can find me on my website at briancoverline.com, where I do daily posts, and also on Google Plus, where I do daily posts. So, is that also at Brian Coverline? Uh, Google, it's Google.com plus Brian Coverline. <laughs> I'm sensing a theme. That's good branding, Brian. Yes. <laughs> Casey, where do we find out more? Uh, Planetary.org, of course. I'm the director of advocacy here at the society. Then also next week for anyone in the D.C. area, I'm going to be at the Humans to Mars Summit. I will also be uh, at the uh, USA Science and Engineering Festival next weekend. So if you're in town, shoot me a text or uh, not a text, I guess, tweet, tweet at me, at Casey Dreyer on Twitter, at Explore Planets is our main site, but just planetary.org points you to all the right places. Dave Dickinson, do you, have you slept yet? Uh, actually, I finally slept yesterday, yes. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah okay. uh, I am Astro Guys with a Z. It is eclipse season, so yes, it was eclipses, all, all eclipses all the time this week, and my next article is probably going to be on the next eclipse, which is a central annular eclipse over Antarctica, but Australia will get to see it as a partial, so I'm writing up an article on that. Right, you get those, those pairs, right? You get lunar, solar... Yeah, it's always uh, solar. Yeah. So the next one is a partial solar eclipse on April 29th. Jason Major, where do I find out more? Uh, I was born at lightsinthedark.com uh, to my space life, and I've since migrated to Universe Today and Discovery Space News. Uh, I'm also on Twitter, uh, at JP Major, and I'm on Facebook and Google Plus as well. For, so all space, all the time. Awesome. <laughs> all right. And, of course, I'm Fraser Kane. Uh, if you haven't already, subscribe to, to this YouTube channel so that you'll get these videos 
uh, suggested to you on a regular basis. Also, if you want to see some of the other stuff we're working on, uh, go to patreon.com slash universe today and you can see all the other projects that we're working on and uh, ways that you can get involved. So thanks everyone for participating as the panel. Thanks to everyone for watching. Uh, and I, I apologize in advance when this video gets taken down for copyright <laughs> violation for us displaying will, uh, NASA television. This will um, be the lost episode. This will be the lost episode, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, people, people will have to just remember an oral tradition of what happened in this episode. <laughs> I remember. I remember the days. All right, well, thanks, everyone, and we'll see you all next week.